Now, that was a turning point in my life because I had a choice to make. Do I agree with him or do I do something different? And I looked over at him and said, I'm going to show you. By the way, did any of you guys go to school with me in about sixth grade? <laughs> no? Okay. I'm still looking for that guy. Because <laughs> when I find him, I'm going to thank him. Because that was a turning point for me. I came home and told my mother, I said, Mother, I'm going to the Olympics. Now, I didn't know what it was going to be in. It wasn't going to be in track. I ran a 100-yard dash in 12 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't going to be that. It wasn't going to be any sidious, altius, fortius sport. You know, that's... You know, stronger, higher, faster. What's it going to be? Well, a friend of mine said he was on a rifle team. I didn't know anything about rifle shooting. So I asked him, I says, well, tell me about rifle shooting. How tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? He said, oh, it doesn't matter how tall you are. And I said, really? How strong do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Rifles aren't that heavy. Hmm. How fast do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? He said, you don't understand. You don't have to be strong or tall or fast. Be the best shooter in the world. All you have to do is stand still. <laughs> I've been training for this sport all my life, man. I can do this one. It's moving I have the problem with. If it's just, if all I got to do is be still, maybe I can do this. So I went to rifle practice with him. I was so excited. They let me shoot the first, the first week. And I wasn't good at it. But I wasn't bad at it. It's the first thing I've ever done in my life. I wasn't bad at it first. I was average the first time I did it. I had moved myself all the way up to average the very first day. And I couldn't wait to go back to rifle practice next week. My father took me. We go into rifle practice and they announced it right first. I'm going to close down the program. I've got a something problem with the range. Oh, I was devastated. The one thing that I thought I could do was being jerked right out from under me. As we're walking out the door, uh, my dad looked down at me and he says, what's wrong with you, son? And I said, I'm not going to get to shoot. And my dad said, no, they're not going to get to shoot. I'll take care of it. I'm your dad. Somebody was there for me. Somebody caught me when I fell. I didn't know what that meant. He said, I'll pick you up from school tomorrow. Well, he never did that before. I always rode the bus. There he was. Picked me up from school. I jumped in the car. In the back seat were rifles, coats, slings, gloves, everything we needed. He'd made arrangements to get a range for us to shoot on. And he picked me up from school three days a week and took me to rifle practice and taught me how to shoot. My dad was a pretty good coach. I worked with him for about a year. And um, the second competition I competed in was the National Junior Service Rifle Championships. I didn't know anything about competition. All I knew was what my dad taught me. But it was enough to win that junior title that first year. Oh, I was excited now. I was a national champion. I had my ticket. This is my vehicle. This is what I was going to do to get myself to the Olympic Games. <laughs> Worked real hard in high school, went to high school not very far from here, in, uh, up in uh, Richland High School in Richland Hills, and shot on a rifle team there. Went to college at UTA, not very far from here, four-year All-American there. Went, got myself in the United States Army, where they have a special training program that helps uh, Olympic hopefuls and marksmanship uh, develop themselves. And I want to thank all of you taxpayers for the opportunity in the military for me to be able to compete in the Olympics. I, Olympics is uh, not so, so cheap. Rifle shooting is, a, is the second most expensive sport in the Olympics to train for. The most expensive sport is equestrian. So I needed help. I needed help in bullets. I needed help in, in, in coaching. And I needed help in travel. And the Army provided that. So I worked very hard in uh, three years into that assignment. 
were the tryouts for the Olympics in 1972 from Munich, Germany. I found myself finishing second in the tryout. They only take two shooters per country. So I was on my way to the Olympic Games. Now at that point in my life, my teammate, Jack Ryder, was the best rifle shooter in the world. He held the world record. He was the current world champion. He'd won a silver medal in the previous Olympics. Everybody expected Jack Ryder to win the gold medal in the Olympics, and I was training with him every day. I was learning a lot. I was getting better faster than he was. By the time we got to, to Munich, Germany, my practice scores were sometimes better than his practice scores. All I had to do was perform in the competition like I'd performed in practice, and I was going to win the Olympic gold medal. So we're riding out on the bus to go to the Olympic Games. And at that point in, in my life, if you'd have asked me what percentage of what you do is mental, I would have said, oh, everything I do is mental. 90% of what I do in shooting is mental. But I knew how to do it. I said, I know everything you used to know. All you have to do is concentrate, be positive, visualize what you want, relax. That's all you have to do. But that wasn't enough. We got to the Olympics on the line. They said commits firing. The competition started. Rifle shooting is the only sport in the Olympics where you're trying to make the body stop. The 10 ring is the size of an eraser at 50 meters. The angle of error at the barrel is very small. We shoot between pulse beats. You've got to shoot in between the pulse beats. So we run so we get our pulse rate down to 60 beats per minute. So all we have to do is line it up and shoot. But I was in the Olympics and my heart rate wasn't cooperating. I didn't have 60 beat per minute pulse rate. I had 600 beats per minute pulse rate. I was bouncing all over the place. I was choking in the Olympic Games. I had no mental game. I shot nine after nine after nine. Shot myself out of a chance for a gold medal in the Olympics. Came home with a silver. Now you might think that's a pretty good thing, coming home with a silver medal. But you might forget the fact that I'm from Texas. <laughs> Let me tell you what Texans think of silver. <laughs> I came home, people said, were you in the Olympics? Mm-hmm. Did you win anything? I won a silver medal. Hmm. <laughs> Who won the gold? <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're a winner down here, you're praised to the hilt. If you're first runner-up, it's, well, uh, come back next year, you know. I don't think that that winning's bad. I don't think that a silver medalist is a loser or anything like that. All, but I can tell you this. They treat the winners a little different than they treat the runner-up. We work with PGA Tour players today. If you win a PGA competition, a, a major PGA event, you'll win a million dollars. But if you're first runner-up, you win a half a million. That's still a lot of money, but it's not a million. Tell me that winning's not important to an elected official running for an election. When he almost wins the seat, he's almost a senator, he's almost a congressman. They almost have the party in power. Tell me about winning and how important it is if you're bidding for a contract and you're in your, your own a company. And the contract could make your company, but somebody else gets it because you were first runner up. There's a time when winning is very important, and I realized that I needed training in winning. I needed to learn how to win. So I came home from the Olympics looking for a course and how to manage the mind under pressure. So where do you go for a course like that? So I went to the best psychologist I could find, and this is back in 1972 when we couldn't even spell sports psychology back then, and we're a little better at it today. But 1972, when I went to see the psychologist, here's what, I, what happened. I went in and I, he said, um, what's wrong with you? I said, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm number two in the world. I want to be number one in the world. He said, I can fix that. Six months of therapy, I can get you okay with being number two in the world. 